All right, well, good morning. Man, is anybody excited to be in church today? I mean, you guys can do better than that. Y'all excited to be in church today? Come on. Well, it's a good day to be in church. And, uh, you know, I was just thinking, I want to give Pastor Tom a little shout out. I was watching that video, and you guys probably don't know this, but all of our graphics and all the videos, you know, we've got creative people in the house that do that. But I saw Tom uh, bought a flannel kit and some old Sunday school stuff off eBay. And so the making of this, he was walking through a few weeks ago with this old kit, and all that stop motion uh, work that he did, that he put in to get some of those Bible characters. Can we just say thanks to our creative team for all those extra little touches they do? So fun. And greetings to everybody joining us online, everybody at our Prophetstown campus. Can you just on three shout good morning to Prophetstown? One, two, three. Good morning, Prophetstown. We love you so much, and uh, it's going to be a great day. We're in the second week of this series uh, where we're looking at some of the superstars from the Sunday school stories that we grew up with. And I just want to remind you as we go through this series that these are very real people. These stories actually happened. Uh, these people, they had real problems. They, they made some real mistakes. They learn some valuable lessons that, that we get to learn from them. And uh, today we're talking about a guy who made a lot of mistakes, actually. Uh, his name is Samson. How many grew up uh, hearing the story of Samson as a kid? Okay, a lot of us. And I, I think today many people still consider it uh, to be a kid story. And if you went to Sunday school, you probably heard a few specific events of Samson's life told in a kid-friendly, G-rated version. Uh, but I just got to warn you, uh, I've been studying the life of Samson all week, and uh, it should be rated for mature audiences only. <laughs> like, seriously, there's intense violence, there's gore, there's disturbing in images, there's sexual content, there's suspense. I mean, we see murder and gambling and anger, betrayal, revenge, battle scenes. He's sleeping with prostitutes. Animals were absolutely harmed during the making of this story. And uh, something you'll discover today, if you didn't know already, is that Samson is not a good role model. You know, we, uh, we talked about Joseph last week. Joseph had some incredible qualities and incredible character. And it's like, in many ways, man, I want to be like that. I want to learn from him. Samson is not the kind of guy I want my boys to grow up and be like. Like, Samson had no respect for God. He was promiscuous. He was violent. He was arrogant. But he did do some pretty cool stuff. In like an 80s tough guy kind of way. Like, I mean, Samson, Samson did some pretty cool stuff. And his story is found in the book of Judges, chapter 13 through 16. If you'd like to read it on your own, you won't be disappointed. Uh, but Samson, not only is his story found in Judges, but he was one of the judges in Israel. And don't think of like a court judge. Think of more like a military leader. Samson led Israel for 20 years, and he's famously known for having two uh, physical character traits. Uh, help me out. What were those two things? Long hair and what else? Strength. Right? Samson was strong, and not just like he spent a lot of time in the gym strong. Samson was a super soldier, and his strength didn't come from a lab experiment or an insect bite. Okay, Samson's strength came from God. Judges 14.6 says, The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson one time so that he tore a lion apart with his bare hands as if he might have torn a young goat. Now, personally, i got to be honest, this comparison doesn't help me out a lot. Uh, I've never torn a young goat apart, and uh, I, I hope to never have that experience. But I think we can all agree, encountering a man-eating beast in the wild and then ripping that lion apart with your bare hands, like how many of you say that's impressive, right? 
Samson is a strong dude. Another time in Judges chapter 15, in verse 15, we see him surrounded by his enemies. And so he picks up the jawbone of a dead donkey and he kills a thousand men. Like that's even hard to wrap your head around. Like one guy strikes down a thousand Philistine warriors with the jawbone of a donkey. Another time he got so angry with the Philistines, uh, the Bible says in Judges 15 that he went out and he caught 300 foxes, which is impressive in and of itself. That he went out, he caught 300 foxes, and then he tied them together, tail to tail in pairs, fastened a torch to every pair of tails, lit the torches, and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and the standing grain together with the vineyards and the olive groves. I mean, this is who Samson was. And as you can imagine, the Philistines, they hated Samson. I mean, he slaughtered thousands of their men. He's burned up their crops. And so they've tried multiple times to capture him. And uh, one time, they get him trapped inside the city gates. And, you know, there's really no way he can get out. Except Judges 16, verse 3, says he just got up, took hold of the doors of the city gate, together with the two posts, and he tore them loose, bar and all, lifted them to his shoulders, and carried him to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. I mean, it's like the guy's unstoppable. And he knew it. He's like, he's like, what are you guys going to do? He's got supernatural strength. He's anointed to defeat the Philistines. Like, that's his God-given purpose. But finally, Samson's enemies find an area where he's weak. And it wasn't kryptonite or anything like that. Samson's weakness was women. And finally, they come up with a scheme that was effective I'm going to tell you that story in just a moment. But Samson was eventually captured by his enemies. They gouged his eyes out. They then forced him to do slave labor in a grain mill. And Samson, this great mighty man, spent the rest of his life as a blind prisoner of his enemies. And I think if we could invite Samson into Sunday school to teach us some things and to talk about his life, I, I really think that he would talk about being blind. And our key thought for today, if you're taking notes, is this you don't have to lose your eyes to be blind. Like, how many of you know you can have eyesight and still not see some things clearly? You know, I would argue that we all have blind spots in our life, things that we just don't see. And we don't know, and we don't even know that we don't know them because, because we're blind to them. Right? And honestly, I think that's a big part of the reason why Jesus started the church. And why church is so important. This is we come together, and we gather in times like this, and we get a fresh perspective on life. And how we're viewing things. You know, Psalm 119, David says, Lord, your word, it's a lamp for my feet. Like, your word is what lights up my path, and it's God's word that helps us to see things clearly. Like, I can't tell you how many times personally that I've been reading the Bible, and all of a sudden, the light bulb goes off, and I see some things that I hadn't seen by before, and it's like, oh, I got to change, and it is. It's life-changing, and I need that in my life, like ongoing. I need that in my life. You need that in your life. The fact of the matter is, there's some of you here today and you're blind to some things. And you may not even know it. But you are. And if you don't open up your eyes, it's really going to hurt you. So I'm going to ask you to take a moment and just open up your hearts to God's word. And I'm just going to pray for a second. But would you just open up your heart and would you just pray for a moment? Would you say, God, help me to see things clearly? And God, would you do that today? God, would you shine the light of your word? God, would you light up those blind spots that we all have? And God, would we leave here different because you've helped us to see things clearly? In his precious name, everybody said, amen. All right, well, if you're taking notes, 
If Samson were teaching us today, I think he would say that you don't have to lose your eyes to be blind to God's purpose. Samson certainly was. Even though it had been very clearly revealed, he still couldn't see it. You know, Judges 13 in verse 1 says, Again, the Israelites, who are God's chosen people, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines, their enemies, for 40 years. But God still loves Israel, and so he sends them Samson with his super strength to deliver them from the Philistines. An angel of the Lord actually showed up to Samson's parents who were unable to have children, and he said this in verse 5. He says, you will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor. That's a, that's a fact you're just going to want to hold on to for later in the story. Because this boy is a, to be a Nazarite dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. And after some further instruction, verse 20 says, The angel of the Lord ascended in a flame. And seeing this, Manoah, who was Samson's father and his wife, they fell with their faces to the ground like it was a powerful moment. It was undeniable. God spoke to them through an angel, and then miraculously, they do give birth to a son who has supernatural strength. Like Samson's purpose was abundantly clear, but he was still blind to it. And you're probably wondering, like, how's that even possible? I mean, like, there's an angel and the flame and, like... How could he miss that? But as Christians, if we're being honest, I think we all have moments where God's purpose is revealed. I think we all have moments where we know what God has created us for. And we know what God wants us to do. We have those moments of clarity maybe in a church service like this. Or at camp, or at times in God's word, where, man, you just know that you know God's speaking to your heart, yet so quickly, so quickly, we can walk out and live a life that doesn't even remotely resemble that purpose. You know, maybe today, like Samson, you know, your purpose has been revealed, but you're still blind. You're not... You're not seeing it right now. And if I can be honest, this is one of my greatest concerns for the church of Jesus Christ. It really is that it's one of my greatest concerns that so many of God's people are going through life without a clear sense of why your life matters. You know, Proverbs 29 and verse 18 says, Where there is no vision, no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. Okay, in other words, when there's no vision from God, where people can't see or accept divine guidance for their life, they cast off restraint. You know, that's what Samson did. He cast off restraint. He lived a life of sin. He lived a life of compromise. And he clearly ignored... God's commands for him that were given by the angel. The angel, you know, had told his parents, there's, there's a few things that Samson cannot do. And he just went out and he did them anyway. He ate defiled food. He touched dead carcasses. Let his hair be cut. And I'm telling you, friends, when you don't see God's vision for your life, you're in a dangerous place. And that's why our church is very passionate about helping people to discover their God-given purpose and teaching you how to live your life fulfilling it. So much of what we do and what we teach and what we preach is revolved around that because it's so important. And if you're sitting here right now and you're saying, Pastor, I don't know that my purpose has been revealed. I don't really know why I'm here and what God's created me for. Man, I just want to encourage you to sign up for Growth Track. It's something that that we've put together, uh, and I just would encourage you to allow us and some of our people to walk alongside with you man, and help you discover that because it's so important. 
Number two, you don't have to lose your eyes to be blind to the power of relationships. In fact, the first action that we see Samson taking in Scripture is he marries a Philistine woman, which is a clear no-no. Uh, God didn't want his people to marry outside of the Jewish race, and that had nothing to do with skin color. It was a point of purity. It would be like in the New Testament uh, where the Bible talks about Christians marrying non-Christians, which if you didn't know, the Bible says don't do that. Don't do that. In fact, 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. What do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? And this command isn't to be restrictive or mean. This command is for your own good. Because if you're unequally yoked in your marriage, it's going to cause all kinds of pain. And it's going to cause division, not just for you, but for the children that you raise. You know, Samson's parents, they warned him against it, but he ignored his parents, totally ignores their advice, and he marries this woman who has a different set of beliefs, different behaviors, different values, different culture. She has a different allegiances, and this decision ends up being one of the worst decisions of his life. The story ends with a ton of heartache. Leads to death, a whole bunch of destruction. In fact, his first wife and her father end up getting burned alive by their own people. Like it, it, was, it was really bad. But Samson was blind to the power of relationships. And he does it again. He falls in love with yet another Philistine woman, whose name you probably know. In fact, you can't hardly say Samson without thinking about her. I'm talking about Samson and Delilah. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 16 and verse 4 that sometime later he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and they said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength. And how we can overpower him so that we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So that's about 28 pounds of silver from every one of the Philistine rulers. So Delilah, she agrees and she says to Samson, she says, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied and subdued. And, uh, you know, Samson just isn't the sharpest tool in the shed, okay? Like, <laughs> at that moment, if she's asking those kind of questions, like, this is a bad relationship. But he doesn't care, and he is at least smart enough not to give away the secret of his strength right away. And so he lies to her. And he says, if anyone ties me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she tied him with them. And with men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the bowstrings as easily as a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. And then Delilah said to Samson, you have made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now, tell me how you can be tied. Now, I'm going to state the obvious here, but alarm bells should be going off for Samson <laughs> about this time. I mean, she just does the exact thing that you told her would, would ruin you, and then your enemies suddenly show up like coincidence. He's got to see what's going on there. But amazingly enough, the same thing happens Three times. First it was the bowstrings, and then it was seven new ropes. Same thing happened again. Then he says, if you braid my hair into the fabric of the loom, I'll become then as weak as any other man. Yet every time he tells her the fake secret of his strength, uh, the Philistines, they appear to seize him. He snaps the bowstrings. They appear to seize him, uh, he snaps the ropes. They appear to see him, and I mean, he just walks out unharmed, pin and loom, still attached uh, to his hair. And so in verse 15, you know, she's really putting the heat on him. She says, 
how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you've made a fool of me, and you haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging. <laughs> Careful, I made him, brother. Careful. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. And what I want you to see right now in this point of the story is how miserable this bad relationship was making Samson. He's so miserable, the Bible says he's sick to death. And it caused him to compromise. All the nagging, all the prodding. Samson ends up doing something that he probably never would have. Verse 17 says, he told her... Everything. Like what an idiot. He tells her the truth this time. He actually reveals to Delilah the secret of his strength. He says, no razor has ever been used on my head. Because I've been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. You just read that and you shake your head. You go, Samson, bro. How could you be so blind? But some of you sitting in the room right now, you can relate to Samson. You know what it's like to have destructive and manipulative relationships. Maybe you've got people right now very close to you that are not spurring you on towards God's purpose. In fact, the enemy is using those people to pull you away and hold you back and remove you from God's blessing and favor on your life. And it might just, if it hasn't already, bring you to a point where you're forced into situations that you didn't want to be in, where you do things you said you'd never do, but man, you've been blind to how negatively those impact relationships are affecting you. Samson was blind to the power of relationships, and ultimately it led to his downfall. Verse 18 says, when Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines... Come back once more. He's told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him and his strength left him. Then Delilah called. She said, Samson, just like she had three other times, the Philistines are upon you. He woke from his sleep and he thought, I'll just, uh, you know, go out as I have before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then in verse 21, the Philistine seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding grain in the prison. So you don't have to lose your eyes to be blind to God's purpose. To be blind to the power of relationships. And number three, you don't have to lose your eyes to be blind to the effects of sin. To be blind to the outcome of disobedience. In fact, I would argue that many Christians today are blind to what their disobedience is actually costing them. You know, you just talk about the matter of relationships like Samson did. I mean, the Bible is very clear when it talks about sexual purity. And what God's plan is for marriage and what God's order is for the family. 
Yet I see so many Christians today openly living in sexual sin. And not like, oh, I was tempted in a weak moment and God forgiven me, but just like openly having sex outside of marriage, living with people they're not married to. Totally unaware of the effects of that disobedience. And I'm not just talking about eternity and will God forgive me and can I still go? I'm, even talk, I'm talking about here and now. Like Samson was miserable even in the middle of that relationship. The reason why God gives us these commands about our relationships and about sexual purity isn't to be mean and constrictive and strict. He gives those for our good and for our benefit. And he gives us those commands because if we're obedient to him in those areas, it brings all kinds of blessing in our life. He says, I created you. I know what you need. Trust me in this. And it breaks my heart how many Christians are blind to the effects of disobedience and what it's actually doing to them and their legacy and their soul and their children. You know, not just sexual temptation. You know, the Bible talks a lot about the purity of our words. And about how destructive gossip is, gossip is, and hateful, divisive speech, and all those things. It grieves God's heart. Yet, sadly, the last couple of years, that's something that Christians have been nationally known for. And I think that really grieves the heart of God. And you see, Christians, they get proud about it, they get dug in, and they're totally blind. To the effects of that disobedience, not just for the church and for the Christian witness, but for their own soul. You know, and it's not just even, it's even like, I wouldn't say little stuff, but foundational stuff. Like, God gives us commands of how we live our lives and how we prioritize our lives. And he says, if you walk in this, you're going to be blessed. But it's amazing to me, even in things like water baptism. Like, Scripture is really clear. Repent and be baptized. And then you'll get taught everything you need to know about me. But repent, be baptized. Like, like that's it. Like, repent, and man, go public with your faith. Make this public confession, yet so many people don't. Well, I don't, I don't, I, you know, you don't want to see me wet. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of nervous about being in front of people. And I just think, man, Jesus went to the cross for you. And he died a humiliating, publicly painful death for your salvation. And he says, hey, follow my example and be baptized in water. Don't be blind to the effects of disobedience. You know, Genesis 4 and verse 7 says, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you. Like sin desires to rule over you. It desires to, to destroy you. So the Bible says you must rule over it. You got to be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Even if you're blind to it right now, this truth is for real. And some people say, oh, well, pastor, that's Old Testament. This is all Old Testament stuff you're talking about. You know, in the New Testament, there's grace. And you're right, there is grace. And it's powerful. And I'm telling you, His grace is bigger than your sin. And His grace gives you salvation and eternity in heaven and position with Him that you don't deserve and I don't deserve. His grace is incredible. But Paul asks the questions in Romans 6, and he says, should we keep on sinning so that God can just show us more and more of this wonderful grace? And there's a lot of people today that have that attitude. Well, I'm just going to sin, and I'm going to do whatever we want. Thank God there's grace. He'll forgive me. And you're right. If you ask him, he will. But that doesn't mean that you won't reap what you sow. And that doesn't mean that that sin and that disobedience won't cause, ser cause heart serious heartache in your life. 
Paul says, should we just keep on sinning so we can boast about more of his wonderful grace? And he answers his own question. He says, of course not. By no means. We've died to sin. How can we continue to live in it? Samson was blind to the effects of sin. He couldn't see how much it was destroying. I'm not just talking about like, hey, he got caught and he got his eyes gouged out. I think Samson was pretty arrogant and didn't realize where his strength came from. And, you know, I think I see this happen with a lot of Christians today is you, you sin a little bit and you start to kind of wade into that. You know, I know I'm disobedient, disobeying God here, but, you know, I've been doing it for a little while and it seems to be okay. And it's just kind of a slippery, gradually slope of harden your heart towards God, ignoring that conviction of the Holy Spirit, and just getting a little more comfortable in disobedience, and a little more comfortable in disobedience, and openly disobeying God. And I'm just telling you, if you do that long enough, God's going to say, okay, you can't outrun my love, but if you want to live outside of my covering... If you want to live outside of my hand and blessing and favor on your life, I'm going to let you. You know, when you think about Samson's story with Delilah, I read it earlier. He expected to just get away with it like he had so many times before. He expected to just get up and walk out unharmed, but he did not realize that the Lord had left him. Samson was blind to the effects of sin. You don't have to be. In fact, the key verse for our series is Romans 15.4. It says, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. You don't have to learn this lesson the hard way. You can learn from Samson. And I want to give you three final encouragements from Samson if you're taking notes. Number one, put God first. <laughs> If you want to be blind, put God first. I guarantee you, I mean, if you could talk to Samson today, at the end of his life, he would say, he would implore you to put God first. And there's a lot of scriptures. I don't need to read them to you. There's, it's one of the Ten Commandments. Have no other God before him. So many promises of what happens if you actually do this. And I almost hesitant to use this phrase, put God first, because so many Christians, like, you know you're supposed to do that. And people say, you know, if I ask you, who's first in your life? Oh, God, yes, definitely, Pastor, I know. You know, I know the or it's God first, family second, da, 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 da. And so many Christians, we say that with our words, but so many times we're blind to the fact that God's not actually first. And so many times people say that with our words, but in reality, God's not the first priority. And so you probably know you're supposed to put God first. My question is, do you? you know, do you really? Like if Jesus himself were to come over to your house this week and sit down at your table and start looking through your calendar, would that reflect that he's your number one priority? Well, I know Jesus, but, whew, you know, <laughs> kids got games, and, you know, we've been busy. We've had other stuff going on. I mean, I don't know how many more days we're going to get like this, and, you know, I, I know I should put you first in my day, but I got, I got a busy job, and I just can't wake up that early. You know, if Jesus were to go through your finances with you, sitting there, would he say, well done, good and faithful servant. Man, it's clear that I'm first in your life. You know, is he really? Samson would say, you need to put God first above your personal preferences, above your own position, and above everything. Put God first. If you don't want to be blind, number two, choose your relationships carefully. 
1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33 says, Do not be deceived. Okay, don't, don't deceive yourself. Bad company ruins good morals. Don't kid yourself into thinking anything different. Okay, this is truth. Proverbs 13 and verse 20 says, Walk with the wise and become wise. How many know there's positive power in relationships, right? When you find the right relations, the right people, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools gets their eyes gouged out. You know, I heard a pastor say one time, you show me your five closest friends and I'll show you your future. I think that's true. And you may be asking me, have I been choosing my relationships carefully? And I want to give you four things. I'm not going to unpack these, but you can write these down. Here's four things you can do to choose your relationships carefully. Uh, nurture the important ones. Restore the broken ones. Sever the harmful ones. And initiate some meaningful ones. And maybe some of you, as I read those off, that you'll know what your next step is. You maybe need to nurture the important relationships. Maybe there's some broken ones you need to restore. Maybe there's some harmful ones that, man, you need to sever that relationship. Maybe there's some meaningful ones that you need to initiate. And this, so we all need that. And some of you, you're, you're new to the faith. Maybe you're the first one out of your family or your prior friend circle to get saved and become a Christian. You got to It's so important that you surround yourself with the right people. And if practically, man, you come to church, you hang out, you build relationships. Uh, we've got hundreds of people that meet every week in life groups and different coffee shops and in homes. And some of them are Bible studying. Some of them are going out and serving people. Some of them are doing fun stuff together. But you need to, you need to surround yourself with wise people. People that are going to spur you on towards fulfilling God's purpose for your life. Hebrews 10.25 says, Do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. I mean, I think more than ever in my lifetime, I see so many Christians that have given up meeting together. Whether that was because of COVID or just the cultural move to like, that's okay or whatever. So many people, and, they're, and they're even blind to that truth. I'll talk to people, oh, I'm still, we're still here, pastor. We're, man, we're still, we're still part of the church. I, I know it's been like a year, but we're still here. Like in their mind, like they haven't given up meeting together, but practically they have. It says, don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but man, encouraging one another all the more as we see the day approaching. Man, the day of Christ's return, it's approaching. And man, as Christians, we got to be ready for his return. And we got to be encouraging one another and lifting each other up and spurring each other on towards love and good deeds. Choose your relationships carefully. And number three, I want you to remember that failure isn't final. Failure isn't final. There's one last part of Samson's story that I want you to hear today. He's grinding grain. He's weak. He's blind. He's a prisoner of his enemies. And when the Philistines' rulers would gather together, uh, what they would do is they would bring Samson in as entertainment. That's what's happening at the end of chapter 16. And in verse 26, Samson says to the servant who held his hand, he says, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. 
Okay, so if you can picture this, this is a big gathering. Man, who's who, all the rulers, all the leaders, the room's packed. People are even on the roof watching Samson. And then in verse 28, Samson prayed to the Lord. And he said, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more. Amen. Aren't you glad we serve a once more kind of God? That no matter how many times you mess up, and no matter how many times you miss the mark, that you can always cry out to God. And He hears you. Listen, friends, every time you humble yourself and like Samson, you remember where your strength comes from and you say, okay, God, forgive me. God, save me. God, I need you. He's there. You know, and Samson, after royally messing up God's plan for his life, living in sin, living in stupidity, disgracing God, Samson remembers where his strengths come from. And he calls out, and the Lord strengthens him once more. Then Samson, in verse 29, reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And then he pushed with all of his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus, Samson killed more people in that one act when he died than while he lived. Killed more of the enemies of God when he died than when he lived. And by some miracle of God's grace, Samson's name is now listed in Hebrews chapter 11. In what is considered to be the hall of fame of faith. Along with Abraham and Noah, there's Samson. Listen, maybe you're here today and you're watching online and you've had a failure of your marriage. Failure of your finances. Failure in business. Maybe you've had a moral failure. Man, you're somebody that needs to hear this today. You're going to reap what you sow. And you can't stop that. I mean, this, their sin has consequences and it causes pain and it messes things up. And you might be in a mess right now, but you need to know that you serve the God of the second chance. You serve a once more kind of God. And failure is only final if you refuse to get back up. Proverbs 24 and verse 16 says, Though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. They get up every time. And there's somebody here today who needs to get up again. Needs to rise again. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes, and he says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Okay, that should get your attention. This, this, say, this deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of whom I'm the worst. Remember, I talked to you about Paul last week. That persecuting Christians guy, man, he hated the church, did horrible things. He says, listen, you know this. Jesus came to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. But for that very reason, Paul says, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example 
for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. And I just want you to know today that God has immense patience towards you and towards me. And there's some of you here in this room today, and you are going to receive the gift of eternal life. Because he's a God of grace. He's a once more kind of God. He's a God who today wants to open your eyes. And maybe right now for the first time, you're seeing things clearly. And what you're seeing is that you need a Savior. You know, maybe you've gone through life kind of blind to the effects of sin, kind of believing the lie that so many people in our culture do that, hey, I'm a good person. You know, my, my folks are good. You know, I'm not, I'm not as bad as others. You know, I, I just, what I believe, no. Maybe God's going to open up your eyes today and say, listen, there's only one way to heaven and that's through me. And God's going to open your eyes. You're going to see more clearly than ever how desperately you need God to save you. And how desperately you need him to forgive you of your sins and make you new. And I just want to tell you today, that's exactly what he wants to do. Man, today he loves you so much. He's so patient with you. He's so compassionate towards you. Okay, he's not fed up with you. You haven't got on his last nerve. Man, he still desires to have relationship with you. Man, if you call on his name today, man, you can receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus. Listen, he sees you. He went to the cross for you. He took all the penalty of your sin and your mistakes on himself. He endured the wrath of God so that you wouldn't have to. And when he rose from the grave, he broke the power and the bondage of sin over your life. You don't have to live in it any longer. And so I'm going to ask you right now to bow your heads and close your eyes in this room. There's some of you, maybe for the first time ever. Maybe some are coming back to a place of repentance, but you've been blind to how desperately you need God in your life. How much you need His forgiveness. And today, as He's opening up your eyes, it's not to make you feel bad about yourself because he's also wanting to open up your eyes to how much he loves you. And how amazing his grace really is and he's a once more guy, kind of God. And so if that's you and you say, Pastor, I'm ready to receive the gift of eternal life. I need Jesus to be my Savior. Today, I'm going to open up my heart, and I'm going to let him in. If that's you, would you just boldly slip up your hand right now? With every head bowed and eyes closed. Yes. 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 Awesome. Praise God. Yes. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. I'm going to just ask you to call out him and say, Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner. And you're my only hope of salvation. Today, would you come into my life? Would you open up my heart? Open up my eyes? Forgive me today. Make me a new creation. And help me to walk with you all the days of my life. As you keep praying, there's others of you here that are Christians. And you love Jesus. And you're going to heaven and your salvation is secure. 
But maybe today, through the power of his word, he's revealed some blind spots in your life. Maybe there's some areas where you've been living in compromise. Some areas where you've been living in disobedience. And listen, God loves you so much. He doesn't want you to be blind. And if he's revealing some things to you and you're feeling convicted right now, that doesn't mean that God's mad at you. Man, that's evidence that he loves you. And he loves you enough to open up your eyes to some things and to lead you to a place of repentance and to lead you to a place where you can walk in the fullness of his blessing and his favor and his plan for your life. And so I want to give you a moment right now to exercise a discipline that I think is, in fact, a mark of spiritual maturity. And that is if the Lord's opening up your eyes to some things and you're seeing some sin and some disobedience and some compromise, whether it was intentional or not, I'm going to ask you Christians right now to just repent. Just right now in the presence of God, just to say, God... Sorry. God, help me to change. You know, and something beautiful happens when you're willing to do that. The Bible says if we confess our sins, which means we don't make excuses for them or we don't justify them by the culture that we're living in. Well, it's 2022. But we just say, God, your word is eternal. God, your word says that this is sin. And I'm going to say the same thing that you do, man. If you're willing to do that right now, you're going to experience not judgment or guilt. Man, you're going to experience freedom. You can experience a weight lifted off of you. And you're going to experience the joy of the Lord. The Bible says we confess our sins. Men, not only does he freely justify us, but men, he, he forgives us of those sins. And he purifies us from all unrighteousness. And so men and women of God... Man, would you be bold enough... If the Lord is speaking to you about something, to say, okay, God, you're opening up my eyes, and I'm seeing this as you do, and so, God, I'm going to change. God, would you help me? And God, I just thank you for forgiveness in this room. God, I thank you that right now there's some people who, who felt like they messed it up and they blew it, but they're rising again. And they're looking to you for strength. And you're a once more kind of God. God, what we experience right now, a fuller picture of who you are.